I'm just going to give everyone a few more moments to come into the Zoom chat. While we're waiting, if you could put into the chat where you're joining us from today, that would be great. Lovely, amazing. Manchester, Toronto, Canada. Where else are you joining us from? New Jersey. Nice. Ghana, lovely. Milton Keynes, UK, not far from me. Bangladesh, the Netherlands, wow. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Okay. Lovely to have you all with us today. Welcome to everyone joining us from wherever you are in the world. You are joining us for the International Confederation of Midwives, New and Student Midwives Improving Recruitment and Retention event. It's part of the ICM Stronger Together webinar series, which is a webinar series by and for midwives and women. The purpose of the Stronger Together webinar series is to amplify the voices of midwives and women to gather insight that will guide the ICM's work throughout the decade of the midwife. Feel free to share that you're attending the event today on social media, and we encourage you to use the hashtag decade of the midwife and hashtag student midwives. Okay. I'm just going to tell you a bit about the format of today's event. We want to hear from you. So please use the question and answer function in the chat to ask questions to our wonderful panelists and we'll be answering them throughout the event. Speaking of our panelists, I will now introduce each one of them. Starting with Fiona Howard, who is a student midwife and RCM student representative from the UK. Hi Fiona. Hi Alicia, how are you? I'm doing really well, very excited to be here with all of you. Uh, amazing, Our... thank you for having me. Fantastic, thank you so much. Our second panelist today is Ola Jumoke Adebayo. She is joining us from Nigeria and she is an ICM young midwife leader. Hi Alicia. Hi, thank you for joining us today. My pleasure. And we also have Neha Mankani. She's joining us from Pakistan. And Neha is also an ICM Young Midwife Leader. Hi, Alicia. Thank you. Um, really excited to see how many people from around the world are here. So really excited to hear what everyone has to say. And finally, we have Marguerite Pella Marquez. She is a midwifery educator and curriculum developer from the Netherlands. Yeah, wow. Hi Alicia, thank you for it's lovely to join this. And I'll just quickly introduce myself. My name is Alicia Burnett. I'm a student midwife from London in the UK, and I'm also the editor in chief of The Student Midwife, which is an online only journal, the only online only, the only online only flip book style journal written for and by student midwives and newly qualified midwives. Okay, now that everybody has joined us and we are familiar with our lovely panelists, let's get into some questions. The first question that I have for everybody is what inspired your decision to pursue a career in midwifery? And we'll start with Fiona. So I first became interested in midwifery probably about 10 years ago now. Um, I worked for a children's centre um, in Gosport in Hampshire. And I'd see mothers come in for their antenatal appointments. And then a few weeks later, I'd see them come in with their babies. And I found the transformation between pregnant person to parent just absolutely magical. Not only a baby was born, but, but a mother was born. And it, it just blew my mind. Um, a few years later, I had my own children and the care that I received 
throughout the birth of my second daughter was just second to none. That really was my inspiration for applying. I wasn't sure if I'd be able to handle the bodily fluids, if I'm completely honest, but that hasn't been an issue so far, thankfully. Um, I am really grateful that I get to give something back to the birth community that treated me so well whilst I was giving birth myself. That is such a lovely and amazing answer, Fiona. Thank you. You're Just welcome. a reminder to everybody watching, please do um, enter your answers into the chat as well. I'll just remind you of what the question is. What inspired your decision to pursue a career in midwifery? And now I think we'll go to Marguerite. Um, well, my story is a bit different, but I was first working for an international organization and thinking this is not what I want for the rest of my life. And then I started to think, what do I want? So I thought about a lot of things and I didn't know that the midwife existed. And then a friend of mine told her story about her birth and I was like, who did help you? And she told me it was a midwife. And I said, okay, now I know what I want to be. So um, in line with Fiona, it was the story of this friend who told me how she was cared for during birth. And I said, okay, that's what I'm going to do. That's really lovely, inspirational stories I'm hearing. Neha? So um, similar to Marguerite, I also had a career in development and public health before midwifery. So while I was studying, I was pursuing my master's in public health, um, I felt like I had a big focus on maternal and reproductive health and it was something I was really interested in. But my frustration with public health was that it's, it, it moves, like you see results a lot slower and I wanted my footprint to be a little bit more than that. And I love public health, I still work in it, but I wanted my own footprint to be a little bit larger. And I remember I was doing this course called Health Systems Approach to Maternal Mortality. And in that they kept talking about the human resource aspect and how that was a really big part of what was happening with women in the field. Um, and I said, okay, this is, where I, this is where I want my footprint to be. And I found a midwifery school and then I became a midwife. Fantastic, thank you so much. Ola Jamoke, let's hear from you. Um, okay, so uh, I think I had like a light bulb moment for mine. Um, I was in class and then it was like one of my first courses on, um, in midwifery because in Nigeria we usually do maternal and child health. And then I think I was a bit blocked to the realities of women in Nigeria because I was still very young, so I wasn't aware that there were any issues or women were dying. So I'm in class and they keep bringing out these statistics of women dying because Nigeria has like a really high maternal mortality rate. And then I was so pissed. I remember that I was pissed in class that, I mean, it's just simple information. So why are these women dying? So I'm like, okay, I need to do something about this. So I started writing. So I had a blog. So I started teaching women about their health in pregnancy. And then I went in further and further and then I couldn't come out anymore. So I decided to stick to me free. Wow, that is really impressive. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I guess I'll share a bit about um, what decided, what made me decide to pursue a career in midwifery. So I have a background in pediatric nursing. I qualified in 2015 and I worked on a general pediatric ward. I loved looking after the babies. And I found that I looked after a fair number of babies that had conditions that if, their mothers had received X, Y, or Z interventions during the antenatal period, perhaps their outcome would have been different. And also I found that when I looked after the very young babies and the mothers were still breastfeeding, I was absolutely clueless about how to support them because it's not really covered that much during the training of pediatric nurses here in the UK. So, I decided to look more into how I could learn about pregnancy and the processes that a woman goes through, the services that she can access. And the only way I could do that, the only way that I could scratch that itch was to pursue a career in midwifery. And I found my calling. This is where I'm supposed to be. I am happiest that I've ever been in my life training to be a midwife. And I can't wait to get out there and to make the changes that we all want to see. For example, as you said, Ola Jamoke, about maternal mortality, 
we can make a difference now. We really can. And it's a very, very empowering feeling. And anybody that I speak to, I'm trying to encourage them to become midwives too, because we need more of them. What is it? We need 9 million more by 2030. So I'm very, very blessed and very, very pleased to be speaking to each and every one of you and for every single person that we have in attendance today. Ah, we have some interesting answers in the chat. This is from Bolan Le. To be honest, I thought a midwife was a housewife. It was my friend that explained it to me. So I went, I pursued midwifery at the age of 17 and after reading Childbirth Without Fear, I fell in love with it. And we have another here from Cora. She's in Brazil. I'm a student midwife in Brazil and here midwives are not that common. I was always amazed by this universe, pregnancy, childbirth and motherhood. And I wanted to be, this chat is zooming. These answers are flying by me. Here we go. I wanted to be a part of this wonderful moment and to make a difference in their lives. Besides, I wanted to take care of people, especially women. That's really lovely. Thank you so much, Cora, all the way from Brazil. And here we have from Sharon. I really enjoyed looking after people. And after hearing my mom's experiences with having me and my siblings in Nigeria, learning about the trends and certain disparities here, and learning about how amazing the female body and the processes of pregnancy and birth are, it continues to blow my mind. I think we can all agree with that. I don't feel that as women, we have an in-depth knowledge of what our bodies can actually do until we begin to train to become midwives and see the act of birth, the miracle that it is every single time we are so privileged to witness it. We have a few more here. Oh, from Franca. I came into midwifery when I was 21 and had just completed an anthropology degree. And that is where I first came into contact with midwifery and learned about different expressions of pain. I thought that's what I want to do, work with women and sexual reproductive health and rights. Thank you for joining us today. That's the president of the ICM, she's in the chat. And here we have another one from Sarah. I was a general nurse when I had my first born daughter, but the midwife who looked after me was the best. She had a heart of gold. She did all this without knowing my profession and that, and that stood out to me. Thank you so much. Keep the answers coming. We're going to move on to our second question now. This is a good one. What challenges do student and new midwives face? And I'm going to go straight to Neha for this one. Thank you, Alicia. So, um, so in Pakistan, just to give you a little bit of background, we have the Community Midwifery Program. It's an 18 month program and it's targeted towards girls who have just finished high school. Um, so what's happening is that when these girls become midwives, they are still very young. Um, and the, you know, most of them are around 19, 20 when they graduate, when they fin finish becoming midwives. And, um, there's a lot of challenges with acceptability in the community as a healthcare provider. It's, this is especially true when they're competing with older traditional birth attendants, because what we're seeing is that I'm sure a lot of you have seen this also in your communities that age is equated with wisdom. So young women, young girls find it hard to find their footing in the community. And the other thing that we're seeing is in rural parts of the country, a lot of girls also have different difficulty with mobility because of their age. It's hard for them to move around in the community and to go to home births. Um, I also personally have experienced that many new midwives in many parts use new and innovative methods. They use new things that they've learned in their work. This can be around newborn care, breastfeeding, and it's not always accepted by the older midwives or by the community. So I also in my work manage a midwifery school. And one other thing that I'm seeing with young midwives and student midwives is that there's this vicious cycle that midwives are getting caught in, especially students, that when they're training, they have to conduct a certain number of deliveries um, to graduate. They have to do a certain number of episiotomies and other important skills. But the cycle they're getting caught in is that the providers who they train with often don't trust them to, um, because of their lack of experience, they'll say, look, you're a student, I'm not letting you do a delivery. And then they get caught in this um, cycle where they don't have the confidence to work alone because while they were training, they weren't given that, uh, that the ability to 
do these uh, to manage these skills which leads to further mistrust by providers by government officials and by community members so because of this i think it's very challenging for the midwives we work with and for us to break into the system thank you that's very interesting Nehal. i've got another mini question for you actually just based on what you've just told us so would you say that midwives training um, student midwives need to have a more nurturing approach? Sorry, do midwives should midwives have a more nurturing approach? Oh, the, the people who are training them. That's yeah. right. Yes. So I think um, they definitely need to have a more nurturing approach. And in my experience, I think what works best is when midwives have worked. Um, so at the health facility that I manage, the, the senior midwives who train the student midwives. And I think that model works well because I'm biased, obviously, but I think midwives are very nurturing. But in places where midwives have had to train in larger hospitals and work with other healthcare providers, they've had a harder, more difficult time. And so, yes, I completely agree that I think if you have that nurturing approach towards the student midwives, they will learn in a much better way. Lovely. Thank you so much. I'm going to go to Fiona. Are you still with us? Yep, I'm here, sorry. That's okay. Um, so the, the slight notes that I made are slightly different actually to um, Niha's um, kind of challenges. One of the, the main challenges for me as a mother um, is the shifts that I work, having two young children, juggling childcare, um, homeschooling throughout COVID, um, the, the long days, the night shifts, weekends, etc. that that takes its toll it takes some organization and a really really strong support network is is crucial i couldn't do it without my support network um my second point was the the emotional and the physical exhaustion um some days i get home from work and i'm physically exhausted from doing 20 to 30 thousand steps according to my watch um and just emotionally, I don't have the capacity to deal with a children, with children and a husband and everything else that life throws at you. You know, the, the juggling act is, is really, really difficult. Um, throwing in also the academic work um, that midwives need to do. I, I think a lot of people don't quite understand that in the UK, it's a full bachelor's degree. Um, and so it's, it's a full level six degree and um, that takes three years to complete alongside other commitments and placement and th there's a lot going on it is tricky um that being said i wouldn't change it for the world absolutely love it can i ask you a follow-up question too yeah in what ways do you feel that for example your educators in practice and at university could support you with some of the challenges that you face? Oh, that is a good question. Um, I mean, my university is very, very good at kind of checking in with us. If they've not heard from us for like a fortnight or so, um, we'll always get an email to say, are you okay? What's going on? Are you keeping on top of everything? What can we do to help? Which is worth its weight in gold. Um, and you know, I think it would be, with, with that in place, I think it would be impossible for, for students to slip through the net. The support is there if need be. The university that I study at in Plymouth also has a lot of mental health facilities. Um, so there's counselling available for students. At the moment, it's all online or over the telephone due to COVID-19. Um, but there are there is an awful lot of support available um, for students that are, are struggling to keep on top of everything. Thank you very much. You answered that really well. I do feel that the pandemic has somewhat forced educators to take those further steps to offer more, offer more support. So in a way, that is one silver lining that's come out of the pandemic. Okay, just a reminder to everybody watching, please do submit your answers into the chat. Just a reminder of what the question is, what challenges do new and student midwives face? Okay, moving on to Marguerite. I, I think that besides the workload, which was already mentioned, and the problems with internship and mentors, 
uh, I think one of the main problems is that there is maybe a difference in what you learn in school and what you see in your internships. For example, you probably learn in school that uh, ECG or cont continuous monitoring is not the best way for women, normal women. And then when you go to your internship, you will see uh, that it's normally done and if you cannot do it it's something they will ask you why you cannot do it um one of one of my my own experience as a as a student is that i i was um learning about fundal pressure and then i was uh, writing my thesis about it and i discovered that it was not the best thing to do to say lightly and then when i went into my internship um, someone asked me to provide fundal pressure and I was thinking of a way to not do it without endangering my internship. So I think that's a real conflict. Um, one of the, on the other hand, as an educator, when I became an educator, I saw it was still in the uh, normal work uh, that students had to learn even though we knew by that time already that it was not something we should support. And it took a while before it get, got out of the educational system. So on both sides, that it is something you learn sometimes in school or don't learn in school, and then you have to do it in your internship. And how do you cope with that as a, you want to give your best practice and then in your internship or during your practice in, the labor world, you see that it's done otherwise, and you probably know it's not good. And how do you cope with that as a student? And how do you cope with that as a as an educator? That's a very difficult question. I don't think there's a single person listening that's not nodding their head. <laughs> there is a huge gulf sometimes between what you're taught at university and what you see in practice. And as a student, it can be difficult to find the word no, or this is not what I was taught at university because we have, we have to get whatever competencies there are in order to qualify for registration completed. At the same time, we want to deliver the best care. And sometimes there is a complete conflict between the two. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And another thing that I think came out of what, you're, what you've just said is that at times it can even be a challenge to promote normal physiology. Sometimes a pregnancy could be completely low risk and as soon as a woman or a birthing person enters a birth setting we start intervening with continuous monitoring with this with that and a low risk situation can sometimes escalate into a high risk one. Yeah, I have to agree with everything you've said. Hola, Jim, okay. Okay, um, so my setting is a bit different. Mm -hmm. So um, as a student, I think one of my biggest challenges was um, having to have lecturers that would keep up with my pace of learning because I was so much fascinated with midwifery. So the way midwifery is in Nigeria, we don't really identify it as midwifery. It's more of maternal and child health nursing. It's very difficult for you to be able to talk about um, physiological birth, normal birth in Nigeria. And then where I school, we usually use the tertiary institutions for learning. So you could never ever get normal physiological birth. So we had to get posted to the communities. The midwives in the communities are quite different from our lecturers in school. So there is like a huge, huge gap. And you have to personally take it upon yourself to, um, to want to learn extra so that you'll be able to get your full competences. So that was one of my greatest challenges as a student. So you have to really, really try to, um, the midwives are very nice here. So especially the midwives in the grassroots level, the primary health center. So they would, they would always teach you. But that was my greatest challenges as a student. But then coming out as a midwife, 
my greatest challenge was forging a career path in midwifery because midwifery is not identified. So there is no MS in midwifery in Nigeria. It's just maternal and child health nursing. So there's just a whole lot of mix up. And then you cannot get, you barely get a midwife led center where you can work freely as a midwife to your full competence. It's um, only in the grassroots, that's the primary health center. And the primary health centers are not many and they barely employ a lot, maybe like five midwives in a primary health center. So I think that would be another thing. So most times, um, even if people get the license, midwifery license in Nigeria, they never really go further with it as a career path because and then the remuneration is so poor. If you go for perioperative nursing, you get paid more than when you have a midwifery license. And then the way Nigeria also is, uh, midwifery is seen as like a basic license, like it's a very, very basic license. People won't even employ you if you do not have a nursing and midwifery license, but it doesn't mean you work as a midwife. It's just a, like a basic um, requirement for employment as a nurse. And so this has been very difficult for a lot of people to even stay in midwifery. And that for me has been something that I have been trying to also walk around a lot. And then I try to help other people that I would be confused and um, areas in which they could go to if they want to work fully as midwives. Wow, thank you so much for sharing that. I have a few answers here in the chat before I share um, what I feel is um, a challenge for me as a student midwife. From Bolanley again, in Ireland, due to, a thought, due to a shortage of birth options, e.g. birth centres, midwife-led units, home birth midwives, we only really get to see a more medicalised approach. Unless you live near one of the two MLUs, midwifery-led units, in the whole, one of the two midwifery-led units in the whole country, it is devastating, especially for those who want to work in the community. You don't get that experience while you are studying. Another one here. Here in Argentina, midwifery is not very well known. We always have to clarify who we are, the things we do, and the difference between us and being an obstetric nurse. From Pia, I think one of the challenges for student midwives is the gap between practice and theory, as you were saying, Marguerite. Oh, lovely. A midwife from Indonesia. Being a midwife in Indonesia, it's not that easy because you'll find out there are midwives in every single city or district. So that's why the biggest challenge for us is how we can be the best and update as a midwife. Another one here, finance is a big, big challenge for students. As a foreigner student in the UK, I don't get any financial support and it is challenging with a full-time degree. I can only imagine. Oh, somebody here has got a comment for you, Marguerite. I certainly agree with Marguerite, even more so when you get further in your education and you need to show what you've learned, but what you've learned from practice and theory are, and the theory at school may be two different things. And we have just two more here. As an aspiring midwife in the USA, we have several paths to become a midwife. I decided to pursue the PEP path, which is an apprenticeship model. I have just found a midwife who is willing to educate and advise me. Being a mother and, and completing the program is not easy, but it will be worth it at the end. Thank you. Thank you so much. And as Fiona demonstrates beautifully, it is hard, but you can certainly do it. Fiona is flying. She's part of the Royal College of Midwives student representatives, aren't you? You're in the forum. She's a big deal over here in the UK, trust me. <laughs> and we've also got one more from Alex. Hello, I'm a midwifery student from Athens in Greece. One of the great challenges that we face here as students is the fact that in hospital, what we are training while studying, we don't see anything of what we learn in theory. In fact, we are exposed to violent practices. That makes me think again about fundal pressure, as you were mentioning, Margaret. Mm. Okay, I'll just share quickly um, a challenge that I face as a student. So here in the UK, as, as is the case in much of the world, um, 
Student midwives were withdrawn from practice due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Here in the UK, we're offered a choice of maintain, staying in practice or withdrawing. I didn't really have a choice because I live with somebody that was shielding. So she's um, my mum. She um, wasn't able to work because she is immunocompromised. So I didn't feel right going into practice and potentially bringing home COVID. This wasn't an option. So I, I'm in my third year, but actually I've been out of clinical practice for six months and I'm actually due to qualify in February. So I've got to cram all of my practice hours and all of my competencies in between now and February. So that's a huge challenge. I am tired all the time. I'm pretty stressed, but I'm really glad to be back with women and back with babies and back with midwives because midwives are my favorite people. That we're all very different from each other. We have our good days, we have our bad days, but the work that we do, we are irreplaceable. And I feel very important. It's part of being, uh, being a student midwife and a prospective midwife is very much part of my identity. So a huge challenge was not being able to do what I love. I do like blended learning. I do like having my lectures virtually via a screen, but you cannot replace being with, being with women, which is what we all want to do. Yes, okay. Well, thank you very much to um, those that responded in the chat. There are loads more messages. There are 24 new messages since I last checked. I'm going to move on to the next question. What are the main barriers women face when pursuing a career in midwifery in your country? There's also a second question. What extra barriers has the pandemic created? And there's a third question. What needs to change to address these barriers and what can governments and decision makers do to help? Let's break that down and take each question at a time. So we'll start with Olajin Moke, and I'm going to ask you, what are the main barriers women face when pursuing a career in midwifery in Nigeria? Um, okay, so here in Nigeria, some of the barriers we face as women, um, being a midwife in Nigeria and also going for midwifery is like double boarding. Um, I've, I've had calls where someone says, oh, they like midwifery, so they said to go through the diploma pathway to be midwife, and then now they can't get a job. And so they are forced to go back into nursing to be able to get a job. Uh, for me, the, it's difficult getting a job if you want to go into pure midwifery as a woman, first of all. And then a lot of midwives in Nigeria are actually breadwinners. So because of the poor salaries and poor remuneration, um, they, I don't want to say there's a cycle of poverty, but then you barely see, um, they literally have to feed like hands to mouth all the time. It's a lot difficult for them and then having to juggle their home. So they have to take on extra jobs. Another issue is um, with system strengthening, um, in system strengthening in general, women use there's a gender issue with it. Women generally aren't able to um, um, study further if there is no internal support from the system, such as refunding or putting a process by which you ensure or, um, that women actually go to school. So a lot of times, midwives in Nigeria are unable to study further. So um, the career progression in Nigeria is more of 30 years in service, 20 years in service. So if you spend maybe three years in a particular position, then you move up further because you spent a certain number of years. So the system doesn't support further education, it doesn't support career progression. Uh, with the pandemic, um, most of the um, midwifery centers are closed. The primary health centers in Lagos here, where I stay, are open because Lagos is very proactive with their health systems. But in other areas, they have had to sh um, shift some of the midwives to other, other health areas, especially um, the, maybe the isolation centers. Now that the isolation centers are closed, people have been shuffled back in, but now everybody's trying to just uh, start their antenatal classes, 
So um, during the pandemic, everything was halted. So there was a lot of effect on not just midwives as a whole, but on women. And uh, for me, I believe that the first thing we need to do is to ensure that um, the government actually identifies midwifery as a profession on, it, on its own. Um, so one of uh, my YML project is to actually uh, was to um, advocate, um, train midwives on policy and policy advocacy. And I was able to train 62 midwives. And then after the training, I actually realized that most of them don't even realize that they, they actually have a say in policy making. And most of them are not even aware of policies. In Nigeria, we don't even have many different policies to start with. So there's really nothing to even start upon or to build upon. We literally have to um, lay, lay a fresh foundation for midwifery policies that would even guide our practice, everything from even how we care for women. There's actually not a lot of things. And so for me, it, the barriers are more than I can explain. It's just a lot. So for me, we need to first start identifying who midwives are. Once we're able to identify that, then we can start building upon that, even through, especially through policies, which I'm a very big advocate of. We need policies in midwifery to actually guide us. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I would like to pay you a compliment. You have many challenges to overcome, but here you are. Here you are, you're still standing. And more than that, you're an ICM young, mid mid young midwife leader. I have so much respect for you. Thank you for everything that you do. Okay. So I've broken down that huge question into three chunks. Oh, Jim, okay, you answered all three in one go. So I'm just going to go around to everybody else. Um, so starting with you, Fiona, what are the main barriers women face when pursuing a career in midwifery in the UK? Thank you, Alicia. Um, so what the first barrier that um, I kind of thought of was actually getting a place at university in the first place. Um, I know so, so many students that have applied year after year after year after year. And I, I don't know if it's, if, if, if it's just luck or, or if there is something different but I know a lot of people that have been trying to achieve their dream for for many many years um, and they don't give up which I think is really really credible and deserves a lot of respect um the, hang on I'm just rereading the question um oh about the the extra barriers that the pandemic has created um, as you said earlier, Alicia, that um, the, all of our lectures are now online. There's no face-to-face -face lectures at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, and I think a large amount of midwifery education can be through storytelling, which is lost when there's a laptop in between. So the, the informal learning opportunities that would come just from a conversation in the classroom are no longer taking place. Everything is structured with a PowerPoint there's no tangent, there's no, there's no cohesive conversation anymore. And I think that the, the potential to lose that mid, midwifery experience from more experienced midwives is, is something that is, would be drastically bad for the midwifery profession. Um, going on from that, studying from home costs money. You need a laptop, you need a reliable internet connection you need printing facilities possibly, which that they all cost money. Um, and the funding for students in the UK, although it's there and is arguably a lot better than other countries in the world, when you're trying to pay full-time childcare plus your rent, plus your bills, plus a new laptop, and now plus for new internet connection, um, it's, it's a lot to pay out for. Um, yeah, I think I've finished my moan. <laughs> you're not moaning, you're being real. And um, I would like to give a huge shout out to the ICM for actually giving us this opportunity because these are the conversations that are had all across the world in WhatsApp groups, in text messages, and 
when it was when we were able to face to face or in the in the staff room um, in the clinical practice area these are the conversations that are being had and finally someone's listening so yeah just speak your mind it's okay you're not moaning at all you're just telling the truth um i just wanted to read a quick message if i can find it <laughs> so there are so many messages in this chat so so many and i'm not going to have the opportunity to read every single one of them but they are all hugely appreciated. I'm loving the amount of engagement that we're getting and all of your responses are being recorded. So they're not just disappearing into the ether. Um, since we're both in the UK, before I go to um, Margarita and Neha, I will just piggyback off what you've said about um, the barrier to women pursuing midwifery in the UK. Um, throughout the pandemic, it's been a trend that women, even prior to the pandemic, so previous to 2017, you could study to become a midwife in the UK for free. So the NHS were providing a bursary which covered your tuition fees. And you also got an amount of money towards um, travel and things like that and, and childcare. That was disposed of in 2017. What that led to was a big drop in the type of applicant that we received. So whereas before, lots of mature students would apply, students with um, caring responsibilities for children or maybe other types of caring responsibilities, they were no longer as able to access um, midwifery training because it was no longer feasible. If you've got a mortgage to pay and you're working 37 and a half hours in clinical practice as part of your training, picking up extra hours to pay to make those mortgage payments, it wasn't really feasible. It didn't fit into a lot of people's lives. So the type of, um, so that has been a barrier to more, more mature students accessing midwifery training here in the UK. Another barrier is that as Fiona said, many, 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 many people apply to, um, apply to become student midwives each year. The challenge that we face here in the UK is that the, the amount of applicants we have drastically outweighs the number of training places. So there aren't enough um, clinical practice placements for the huge volume of people that want to apply to become student midwives. And unfortunately that creates a bit of a stasis. We're never going to meet the, the, the staff um, numbers that we would like because we don't have the capacity to train the number of people. It's never gonna happen. I hope, I hope it happens eventually, but that has been the situation for years. I hope it changes, please, because I would love, I would, I would love in my lifetime to experience safe staffing numbers. Then we'd have less burnout, women would receive better care, and we'd all be happier. That's my moan out of the way. <laughs> and now I'm just going to move on to Neha. What are the main barriers um, that women face when pursuing a career in midwifery in Pakistan? So um, midwifery in Pakistan, it, um, our story is actually very similar to Nigeria. Um, it, it's a very complicated field to navigate Pakistan. And I'll give you the root of it is that, you know, the word midwife, there's no equivalent in Urdu. If someone tells me that, what is a midwife? Can you explain it to me? I can't explain it in Urdu because there is no equivalent word. The word that is used is dai which is the same word that is used for a traditional birth attendant. So, and that is what a midwife is in Pakistan. She doesn't really exist. Um, it's, so what happened was that the program has been around for, 15, for 14 years, uh, the community midwifery program, and it was made so that women in rural areas would have a healthcare provider who could come to them in the community and serve them. But there was no, re there's no regulation of any kind. So it's, so women, so midwives, they finish their diploma, but um, if the government hires them, there's no grade for them in the government. They're paid the same amount as the sweeper in the facility. So the midwife and the sweeper are at the same level. Um, so the same thing, she's stuck, stuck in the cycle of poverty. She's not able to uh, make ends meet. And if she does deliveries in the community, she is able to charge whatever she wants. But the women, the people in the community are, you know, they have, they're very basic, um, they're very basic living they are also not able to pay her. They'll pay her a little bit in their crop or produce or whatever they have. So she's not, so there is no career progression. And um, the community midwifery program after being around 14 years is also in danger now because 
um, the, what the government is talking about replacing it with a BSC in midwifery, so BSCM, but there aren't enough people, we can't even find enough people to do, um, who enough girls who've graduated from secondary school who can serve the community through a di direct entry diploma. So a BSCM is obviously so something that can't be achieved over here. Um, so even though these midwives graduate, the healthcare commission still gives them a really hard time in some places. They'll be working at their clinics and then the next day someone will come and lock the clinic and say, you're not allowed to practice on your own. It's not legal, even though it is legal. But the framework that they operate in is very complicated. And what this, what an overwhelming majority of midwives are saying is that we feel like we just, you know, we became midwives and we were left alone. Um, and because there's no guidance, a lot of them, as Olajimoke also mentioned, that they move towards nursing because nursing is a little bit more lucrative. You know, this, it's very clear what a nurse does. So they'll work towards, move towards nursing or they become community health workers or they'll just change their career and they'll just stop, start doing something else. So um, it's, you know, the loss then is for the midwife and it's for the community. Um, and this is also in COVID times, I think this was also reflected because midwives were again considered the way they are in the government facilities, they're considered bottom of the food chain. So, you know, if there's like five pieces of PPE, a midwife will never be considered important enough to receive PPE. And um, they didn't feel like they were taken care of. And I saw there were some facilities where I saw that um, there was star sharing, but not in the way that it should happen. So there was a there was star sharing in the sense that a lot of providers said, we don't feel safe because we don't have PPE. We don't want to work in COVID. So student midwives will manage the whole facility because it's okay for them to be a little bit unsafe, but not for us. So there was a little bit, you know, there was a lack of equity in how things work in COVID times. Um, so these are some of the challenges that we're seeing. And again, what everyone has, a lot of people in I see in the chat have also mentioned that there's because of all of this, because the, the state and the education doesn't consider midwives to be important. They don't have that respect from healthcare providers or from the community or from the government. So it's just stuck in a cycle. Thank you very much. Kind of hurts my feelings to hear that midwives aren't valued. <clears throat> but it's a common theme throughout the world. Here in the UK, we do have, um, the, mid, the midwife is a protected title and we have protected duties, but I wouldn't say that we are entirely recognized for our hard work and valued as much as I would like us to be. I guess to the general public, we help you to birth your baby, we measure your stomach while you're pregnant and you might see us postnatally and that's all we do. They don't see the blood, sweat and tears that it takes to get you to actually qualified status they don't they're not with you for the whole 12 hour shift and babies were still born during COVID-19 and midwives helped women to birth those babies student midwives were still out in practice in some places in the world so that's no one moaning from me I'm going to quickly read a comment before I um go to Marguerite so this is from Victoria she's in Romania Midwives that graduate here in Romania have little employment opportunities. There aren't many positions available and independent practice is not encouraged. Midwifery care is replaced by the work of obstetricians and gynecologists who are not enough to cover the need. As a result, the interest in midwifery has decreased. The faculties closed and we have less than 1,000 licensed registered midwives. That's very interesting, Victoria. And just one more quickly from Cora, the main barrier in pursuing a career in midwifery here in Brazil is the disinformation and lack of educational programs. There is only one course in one university and nobody knows about it. So most people that want to take care of pregnant women think that they have to be an obstetric doctor. Now, due to COVID-19, the practices and internships are not happening. And the lecturers and the lectures are, are happening online. So that's a big challenge for everyone. Thank you so much for sharing, Cora. Marguerite, what would you say is a barrier to women pursuing a career in midwifery in the Netherlands? Um, well, I would say that it's in the beginning, it's a selection process. So there are uh, um, many applicants, and only about 10% of the people is selected into. Uh, the, the schools 
So I think that that is a major barrier for most uh, women who want to pursue a midwifery career. Um, of course, uh, if it's your, especially if it's your second career, it's a huge fee that you have to pay. Uh, so it's you're not paid for you have to pay for everything yourself and um, when it's your first uh, study um, you pay a bit less than when it's for example your second uh, but still people choose to do it as a second career so that's for the person who really wants it it's not a, um, a barrier um, uh, so I think that's that's the main main barrier uh, when starting a midwifery career. I think when continuing your education, what you see is that when people uh, do not finish, it's main, ma mainly because they are not motivated um, to, um, to, to um, well, how can I say this? It's, a, it's sometimes it, it can be a constant struggle to keep birth normal. And for some people, this constant struggle is too much. And what, at one point they say, okay, well, I've seen it. It's not something I can commit to my whole life. So I'll stop uh, studying midwifery, which is a pity in most cases, because these, these people are very much uh, in favor of a normal birth. And when they quit, we lose uh, advocates for normal birth. Um, so I think that's also a major issue. Um, when you are finally uh, graduated, um, there is not much of a barrier in finding a job, at least not in the Netherlands. You, you normally can f quickly find a job. Uh, but then again, it's still a constant struggle to keep birth normal. Uh, you have a lot of hours, um, you have a lot of shifts, so that can be a problem when you want to combine this with your family. So I think that's the major um, barrier, but it's not uh, like, yeah, it's not, it, you can overcome this. It's not an enormous struggle. I think one of the extra barriers for the pandemic and for midwifery students is um, there are a lot of internships um, they were stopped, so students um, couldn't do their internships, which I think it's a real, real issue, because how can you learn to be a midwife when you're not seeing what a midwife does or doing what a midwife does? Um, and still, even though now they are allowed, uh, for example, um, one of the things that is still a problem is that you're, you're allowed to come to the women to our house to be with the midwife you, the, who's training you. But for example, when it, it's a home birth, you're allowed to stay. But if, you, if they have to go to the hospital, you're not allowed to go there. And um, you mentioned that um, you have to do a certain number of episiotomies and a certain number of uh, deliveries, et cetera, et cetera. A couple of things are normally done in the hospital. Most episiotomies are done in the hospital, for example. So if you're at the end of your education and you really have to do your two episiotomies to graduate and you cannot do that because you cannot go to the hospital to do the episiotomies, whatever you think of it, you cannot graduate. So that's a real problem for almost students. And then, of course, um, it's already mentioned, but the real contact between students themselves, but also between students and teachers, um, that is lacking. And it's not the same if you're behind screen and discussing from a teacher point of view. Normally in class, I can see who's prepared, who doesn't know it, who's, who's, who has a question but doesn't want to ask this. Uh, on screen, it's very difficult. I don't, certainly this new class that started uh, well, in September, I don't know them, I've never seen them in real life. How can I know what they're uh, thinking if I, I don't know who they are? So that's a real, real problem. You know what? I really appreciate you being really honest about that. Because <laughs> us as 
I couldn't imagine if I was beginning my midwifery training in this context. So you need that face to face to, to get a feel for people. Are you going to be someone that I'm going to get on with? Are you going to be my buddy throughout the whole three years? It's not the same meeting each other virtually, particularly if you experience um, technical difficulties as I frequently do. And my, my computer, my video is usually off because things just work better when I don't have video. It's really refreshing to hear Emma Lecture saying that because I do, as much as I do love virtual classes, I can put myself in the shoes of someone that's just starting their maybe free training and they could possibly be feeling a bit robbed because this isn't what this isn't what they fought for. And especially if you're someone that, as Fiona mentioned, that has had to apply year after year after year and you finally get there and you're stuck in your house. So yes, thank you so much for sharing that. Just a quick reminder to um, everyone watching, after this next question, we're going to be in reading out questions from you, the audience members. So please start posting your questions to the panelists in the chat. Just before that session, though, I'm going to ask you all one more question. What needs to change to address the barriers that you've mentioned? And what can governments and decision makers do to help? Big question. Is it okay if I start with you, Neha? Um, yes, absolutely. So I think, um, you know, in response to what I presented as the barriers that we faced, the main thing that I think needs to happen is that the government, the, you know, the, the bodies that created these midwives need to be the ones who um, increase their, you know, who give them a grade. They, once they have a grade and they're acknowledged as healthcare providers, they, the government has to work to increase their respectability in communities and with healthcare providers and with um, wherever they work. So, and what I think needs to happen is that they need to be given, involved in decision-making, midwives need to be involved in decision-making and they need to be given a seat at the table to actually be able to contribute towards their own career. Thank you. Excellent answer, superb. Uh, I'm muted, sorry. Um, I personally think you touched on it earlier, Alicia, when you, you talked about um, the, the old bursary that was revoked in 2017. Um, I'm now paying 9,250 pounds a year to study midwifery, um, plus my, my loan from the government that I will need to pay back when I qualify and then the tuition fees. By the time I graduate, I will be in about 50,000 pounds worth of debt. Um, and I will probably never pay that off, ever. Um, Alicia, you're probably in the same situation with me with midwifery being your second degree. Um, I, I don't know how that is ever going to be recuperated. And I think the government budgets could really do with maybe looking into that and seeing where they pulled the money from when the bursary was still available for tuition fees to be covered, because that would make midwifery so different by opening it up to such a, a wider social demographic, it would completely change the face of midwifery for the better, I think. Bring back the bursary. <laughs> okay, uh, Marguerite? Would you like to add what your feelings are about what governments and decision makers can do to um, help with the barriers that you mentioned? Well, it's a big one, of course. Uh, but um, if we want to, to keep midwives being midwives, we, meet, we, must, um, we must ensure that, that birth keeps being normal. And uh, that, of course, is, is not something um easy to achieve something that's easy to achieve because there are so many forces working around this and also women who maybe do not know what normal birth is and why it's so important that we have normal birth so i think it's it's a big issue um, but we first certainly should um advise governments and policymakers that birth is normal and that it doesn't need to be something very um intricate or or very special or very 
um, dangerous. Um, so, and that midwives are the best persons who can advocate for normal birth. Yeah, we will agree with you there, definitely. Um, Ola Janoke, you mentioned before what you felt that the government and decision, decision makers could do to help with the barriers. Do you want to add anything more? Um, yes, um, I would just like to say that I would actually like to encourage the midwifery associations uh, in different countries. Nigeria, I would like to actually encourage them to actually try to take a stand in decision making areas. Um, I've seen different policies in Nigeria and then I really find it very hard. Like you see the middle frustration written like really small, tiny fonts. I don't think it's encouraging. And I think we should be front and center in battling maternal mortality. Once we are making um, very good efforts in um, doing this, I think people will be first to recognize our work. And then second of all, I think I also want to encourage for more funding. I think we need to start um, talking to the do um, donor organizations and other associations. I mean, it's very easy to find money to train traditional birth attendants or to train a community health extension worker, but then I cannot find money to train midwives further, except I find these specific organizations. I mean, I can only prove that I come very few organizations that I know that support me briefly. So, and I think education is something that goes around every country to either develop or developing. So I think we need to actually keep encouraging or even tell them how they can actually help to fund our education as midwives because we're very, very important in actually ending maternal mortality and child mortality, so basically. Thank you so much. Does anybody else have anything more to add? Okay, I've got a few comments here from the audience that I'm going to read out. This is from Pia. In Italy, with a medicalized system led by obstetricians, there are only a few midwives in hospitals, mainly in the north and center of the country, and there are not enough jobs. Also, midwifery is considered socially and professionally inferior compared to being an obstetrician. It's so difficult to talk to people in my country and explain what a midwife really is and how crucial midwives are in the long term. Probably there are some independent midwives, but being a midwife doesn't mean to be an autonomous professional in Italy. There are legal limitations and the antenatal postnatal care is not in midwives' hands. Thank you, Pia. We also have a comment here from Sharon. Another challenge I found is actually with going back to work. At my hospital here in England, a lot of things have changed. Rules have changed, such as with visitation, and it's frustrating for women and families. And it's strange because midwives are busier. And so as a student, I found myself having to offer a lot more emotional support to women and midwives find even more that they don't feel like they are able to deliver the standard of care that they want to. So in the UK, in the height of the pandemic, all visitors were restricted completely. So um, women, I think at some in some places, you weren't even allowed to have your birth partner with you while you were having your baby. For example, if you're, if you're with your partner while you're having your baby and your partner had to go out to the car to get something, they weren't allowed back in. So when you came to the hospital to have your baby, you needed to bring food, stuff for your partner, clothing, change of clothing and things like that for them. You had to be really, really super prepared and organized. And I'm not sure if that information did filter down to pregnant women who did have their babies during the height of the pandemic. And now visiting is still restricted. Um, there is just ah, one from Joanne from the Philippines. Midwives in the Philippines are considered frontline in the community, serving huge populations and they have a lot of work and functions to perform. The salary is not good and no work opportunity that's, and there are no work opportunities. That's the reason why several midwives are working abroad or in other countries. And Ada in Iran, she says, I'm a midwife from Iran. In, in all the hospitals where we spent our internships, we don't have physiological birth. Most births are interventional. That's fantastic. Now we're going to move on to the um, panelists answering questions from our audience. 
let's see what we've got here for you. I've got loads. Okay. Here we go. A question from Bonaventure in Rwanda. In many countries, there is a myth that the midwifery profession that the midwifery profession is for women. What can we do to encourage men to join the profession? This is a great question. I know quite a few student midwives in Rwanda and a lot of them are male. So this is a very juicy question and I'm going to go straight to Marguerite. Huh. Uh, what can we do to encourage males? Um, well, um, um, oh, well, anything, but there are so many women. <laughs> So maybe they are not encouraged, uh, encouraged at all because there are too many women. Um, but at least I know that um, when uh, in the Netherlands we do a selection process, we, we always hope that there are many men coming and then if we are lucky, there's one. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think if we can get more men, um, there will, uh, it is more likely for more men to join. So that's that's the start. But how can we encourage this? I'm not sure. It is a, it is a tricky question. Um, I mentioned at the beginning of the session that I am the editor in chief of the Student Midwife, which is an online journal. And in April 2021, we have an article that we're preparing now, which um, centers on for male midwives or student midwives, one from Rowan, uh, from Uganda, sorry, at the UK, Scotland, and we're looking for number four, actually. I'm very interested in what motivated these males to apply to become midwives and how they have fared in their journey. So um, if I get each one of your contact details, I would love to disseminate that article to you once it's written, because I think it's going to be a very interesting read. Hola, Jim, okay. I mentioned, oh, don't be shocked. Yes, I'm coming to you. I mentioned that in um, Rwanda, I know quite a few male student midwives and it tends to be quite common in the, in the whole of Africa, actually, that not, not the entire um, continent, but in quite a few African countries that um, men do train to become midwives in some African countries. It's more common than it is over here and in other countries. Is that the case in Nigeria as well? Okay, um, in Nigeria, we actually have two paths for middle for education. You either could go through the post basic diploma or you go to the BSc path. Uh, for the post basic diploma, no. There, there, was, there was actually a time, I couldn't confirm that, but then we heard that they didn't even allow men into the school of midwifery, so we actually don't get men. But for the BSc part, you really can't control who comes in because it's the university system. So for my class, we had like um, four guys, yes, four, five. But then I don't think they still went further to pursue midwifery. <laughs> they just did it. Uh, and usually, even when we go to um, clinical practice, yeah, then say, oh, what are you doing here? And there's actually a lot of labels, and I don't want to use the word, but then there's the word they call them. Like in Nigeria, we uh, we want to say is an show like I don't know how to explain that. Okay, someone like who is womanizing or likes women, so you use that word. So they like to refer to them as that. And then sometimes um, when I was um, in family planning units, when I have to tell my colleague to actually give a family planning method and then you see the women they just go oh, they don't want and I'm like what you have doctors that actually attend to you so why don't you want him as a midwife I think there's also this stereotype where um they don't expect men to be midwives so they cringe at the idea of a male midwife so I think um the stereotype has to work um for me I believe if we start actually giving quotas to men because I know that there are men that actually want to do midwifery in Nigeria, but because of the barriers, they're unable to. So in Nigeria, we actually do not have a lot of men in midwifery. Okay, that's very interesting. I'm definitely going to send you guys the article when it's written, because I'm absolutely fascinated to know myself um, what encourages men into the profession and what is their experience. I don't want to think of us as bullying them out of the profession. However, I can see that 
midwifery childbirth is a very woman-centered, woman-centric thing. And that women and families seeing a man come into that environment, it could, whatever their um, belief system is, whatever their own opinions are, I can see that it can cause conflict there. Neha, how can we encourage men into the profession in Pakistan? So in Pakistan, not, uh, they're not allowed and uh, men aren't allowed to be midwives. So I guess there's no encouraging it. <laughs> Are there any um, males in your cohort? No, none in my cohort at all. Um, I, I, your article probably can correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm sure there's about 2% of midwives in the UK are male. Um, and I think if we need to change that, we need to start at the beginning and we need to change the education curriculum and give boys and girls a more all-rounded insight into sexual and reproductive health. Um, rather than the cringeworthy videos that you watch as a teenager of a woman on her back screaming in pain, and that, that's it for sexual health education. I think we need to show children and teenagers what a midwife does and how a midwife can revolutionize childbirth for many, many women. And boys and girls need to, need to understand that. Really good answers. We have another question here. Oh, from Franca. How can the ICM make sure that we hear the needs of student midwives? Do you have some practical tips that we can use or things we can change to make you part of the conversation while we move forward? Neha? Um, a good question, <laughs> very important. Um, I think uh, ICM, that maybe what ICMs work, I know that ICM works very closely with midwifery associations, but maybe ICM can encourage midwifery association to work with educators a little bit more because I know that a lot of midwifery schools that I have worked at or midwifery educators that I've met have been very separated from midwifery associations. Um, so I think if we can get midwifery educators more aligned somehow with midwifery associations, uh, the midwifery educators can help the student midwives and what they want get, uh, you know, to kind of work with ICM for that because then if we start at the free service level, I think there could be a lot of things that could change. Thank you very much. I'm going to ask you the same question, Fiona. What can the... Um, repeat the question, please, sorry. No problem. How can the ICM make sure that we hear the needs of student midwives? Do you have some practical tips that can make that we can use or things we can change to make you part of the conversation? Yeah, so um, as you mentioned earlier, Alicia, I am the Royal College of Midwives, um, one of the student representatives for the south of England. Um, so the Student Midwifery Forum meet usually quarterly in person at the Royal College of Midwives headquarters in London. Obviously, with COVID, that's kind of changed and is now we have monthly online meetings. It's a collaborative of students from across the UK and Northern Ireland. Um, from all year groups, all cohorts. And we just meet every month and discuss um, any issues at all, any interesting research, anything new that our university are trialing, feed it back to the, to the RCM. And then it, it's been really, really helpful through COVID actually, um, with students that have kind of struggled to understand the, the information that was being disseminated down from HEE and from the NHS. The RCM were really useful um, in working alongside the universities to, to, to make sure that student voices were heard and to make sure that those students were protected in a really, really confusing time. So perhaps a, a handful of students from across, across the globe that meet and communicate regularly and then feedback to the ICM could be an idea. Fantastic. We've got quite a few questions here, so I'm actually going to jump and move on to the next one. This is a really important one. I'm going to come to you, Marguerite, for this one. Hearing about so many barriers, low pay, and that midwives are not valued in many places makes me feel very discouraged. Are you happy you made the choice to go into midwifery? Is it worth it? Yes. 
I can only say yes. For me, it was a big career change, but I, I'm, I'm very happy I did it. Um, I have to say, uh, even though there were some barriers when I, I started midwifery and when I practiced midwifery, um, the changes that you make in other people's lives is, is that it's, you cannot be paid for that enough. So that for me is my reward, the most of it. And of course, yes, we always struggle to be more valued and more paid and everything, everything, everything. But, but that's also a, a challenge and makes it also a bit of fun. So I think I think seeing women and and being able to to um, be with women during their pregnancy, birth, and and uh, postpartum, that is um, absolutely something I I wouldn't have missed in the world. Deborah, I hope that makes you feel a little less dis a little less discouraged. Um, I'm going to move on to the next question. Thank you so much, Margaret. Um, Michaela from Germany asks. What does a supportive environment look like for new and student midwives? And I'm going to ask you that, Neha. No problem. You're muted though. Oh, yes. sorry. Can you repeat the question, please? No problem. What does a supportive environment look like for new and student midwives? Sorry, muted again. So a supported environment, um, supportive environment for new and student midwives looks uh, similar to what I saw as a solution to the barriers that we're facing, that uh, an environment in which, you know, midwives should not be scared to practice their profession, they should be, they should, like, they should be able to practice freely, and they should know um, how they can progress in their career. It shouldn't, there shouldn't be so many questions for midwives, I think, if they knew um, how they can practice safely, how they can progress in their career, how they can uh, meet their needs financially, I think it would just be a lot more conducive for them. Thank you so very much. And um, we've got, we have more than one more question, but I, we've only got time for one more. Here we go. And Ola Jumake, I'm going to ask you this one. How can we encourage people who have the calling or vocation to be a midwife to do it despite the challenges? Thank you so much. Um, okay, so... I would always say that if something makes you happy, you have to keep doing it. But then you also have to look at the side of where you have to make ends meet. I'm not, uh, what I would tell you to do is if you can find another way to end, good. But then if there's another way to also keep um, working as a midwife, um, I work, um, I work. And then I also volunteer in the communities where I can give free antenatal care to women. And um, I'm able to work um, freely as a midwife because I'm unable to get a place in Nigeria where I can work to my full competence. But then um, I found an organization, so I'm able to volunteer freely. I actually work to my full competence as a midwife in the community, give free antenatals, immunizations and everything. For me, I think you need to be able to um, balance it out because the truth is if you're not able to make ends meet, your passion will burn out. So if you're passionate about midwifery and you want to stay in midwifery, try to balance it out, find somewhere where you can make ends meet. And also, you can also just find something else that makes you connect to women. Could be through blogging. I could do it as a student through blogging. Um, I do it now as I'm working and I'm volunteering in community, in slum communities for women that we know can't even access antenatal care. So for me, I think you just have to find the balance. If it's women that you always want to work for, that different ways in which you can work for women as a wife. So I think you just need to find that balance. Thank you so much. And before we move on to the last question, I'm just going to quickly read um, a comment from Oni. Um, this was in response to um, Franca's question about how the ICM can support student midwives and new midwives to make their voices heard. Oni says, students can make their voices heard if they join their midwives association. We are a profession and we need to advocate together for all the elements of the profession that we need education, regulation, scope of practice, autonomy, respect, pay, etc. We need to begin by participating in our profession and supporting each other. We need to stand together and be active. 
I wholeheartedly agree there. So moving on to our last question. In one sentence, what do you love most about midwifery so far? And I'm going to start with Neha because she's got a big smile on her face. <laughs> so um, I love midwifery, as I think a lot of people here do. When I realized um, when, you know, everyone, most midwives have really, really long schedules and really crazy hours. And I realized when I first started, I was like, you know, I'm never tired. And I realized it was because I really love the messiness of real human life. Like, it's just so exciting being part of something that's so intense and so emotional and so important. Um, and that's basically what made me fall in love with midwifery. That's so lovely. Okay, Fiona. You're muted. Sorry. Sorry. That's okay. Yeah. It looked good. <laughs> Um, I I was just saying I love that every day is different. Every woman is different. Every birth is different. Every family is different. Um, the variety is just amazing. Um, the connection that I'm able to make with women after a very short time is one that I'll never, ever get used to. I don't think every time I see a baby being born, I, I get that little, oh, there's another baby. Don't cry. Um, knowing I've made a difference to somebody's day is just, it makes a difference to my day. And lastly, showing my daughters that with hard work, determination, and a good support network, that women are able to fulfill career prospects and motherhood simultaneously. This poor little woman, thank you, just listening to you guys. <laughs> thank you so much, Fiona. Ola Jamake, what do you love most about midwifery so far? Um, it's a lot, but <laughs> I think the best part for me is a woman comes to me and maybe she's in distress or she's anxious and then she leaves and then she feels better um, from offering family planning services to actually helping them from antenatals. You know how pregnant women can be anxious when they have like an issue. And then by the time they're done talking to you, they always, um, they're always so excited that they know that their worries are gone. And it's so, I mean, even if you don't feel loved with them, you feel loved, you feel at home. I think I just really love everything about it. It's not routine like for me. I mean, I have to always use my brain to do something. So, I mean, and then I can always weave into any area I want to be midwifery. I mean, if you want to help women with financing, you can always do midwifery. It's just everywhere. So, I mean, I really, really, really love midwifery. So, this, that's it for me. Lovely. And lastly, Margaret? Uh, what I love about uh, being a midwife is, is that you are... You see them coming in the first consultation and then you are there uh, during a very real moment of their life where they cannot hide. And then they walk away, uh, hopefully very confident with the baby. So that, that process is something I really love about being midwife. But what I also love about being a midwifery educator is that when you see the students come in in the first year, they are like giggly and all new and and very sometimes very insecure and sometimes too secure uh and then um, they are very new and then when they go out and they they finally graduate they are all confident midwives and that's also a lovely process to see it's it's seeing like it's like seeing a new women becoming a mother but then seeing a new student becoming a midwife that process is also very well, it's, it's lovely. Oh, wow. Thank you so much. Um, what do I love most about midwifery so far? I love that training to be a midwife and being a midwife teaches you how to bend and flex around life's problems. Each woman, each family is different. They will all have their different challenges. And as much as we have policies and guidelines in place, quite frankly, to be a midwife is to be creative, it's to be a problem solver because there is no one size fits all for every single person that you meet, it's just not possible. So that's one thing I love about it, the flexibility. 
I also love that to be a midwife and to be a student midwife, especially a senior one as I am now, is to be a teacher. You are, it is your job. It is a key part of your role to educate the women that you meet and their families. And I love that. I love to teach. I love to unlock a woman's mind as to what she is capable of while you're carrying your baby and while you're having your baby and afterwards, you are a remarkable person. If you didn't know it before, I'm here to let you know that you are, you're amazing. Each and every person that we meet and we care for, they're amazing. And it's an opportunity for us to empower them to believe that because it's the truth. I also love teaching junior students. If it's appropriate, I will point out the rhombus of Michaelis, or I will point out this is Wharton's jelly. I will do things like that because I'm a big nerd and I just find the intricacies of our physiology quite beautiful. And lastly, the thing that I love most about midwifery so far is that it's given me purpose. I'm quite intense. I love hard. I'm very inquisitive and midwifery just suits me because you need, you need people like me around. Whereas I wouldn't fit in an office, in an office building somewhere, I really fit here. There are people, These, you are my tribe, you are my people. So yeah, that's what I love about midwifery so far. And I can't wait to qualify. And I hope it's not the last time I see this fantastic panel again. You're all wonderful. And I'm going to be coming off this call with a full heart. Thank you so, so very much for joining us. Um, and I also want to thank everybody that has been in attendance here today. I'm just going to have one more whip round of the comments. And we've got one here from Esther, Esther Banda. I enjoy the relationship we build with pregnant mothers as midwives, the autonomy to make respectful decisions. Just, it's just a wow profession. I have taught student midwives for eight years now and enjoy it so much. Proud midwife and proud midwifery tutor. I'm not about to start crying on this call, but that was just so lovely. It's really nice to end this call with lots of positivity. Oh, I'm going to read some of the comments. It might make you tear up too. Thank you all for this webinar today. It was amazing. And I'm so encouraged to know this global tribe exists. Absolutely. Big thank you for everyone. Thank you, your sweetheart <laughs> encouraged me today as a midwife for 40 years. Thank you for remaining in the profession for so long. Wonderful panelists. You are a wonderful, proud of future midwives from Nepal. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you so much for this webinar. My joy and love for the job have gotten even stronger somehow. Such a feeling of belonging. You're all amazing. Oh, I can't stop smiling. That's so lovely. Um, I'm going to... Um, say a final goodbye. Um, I'm going to invite each panelist to say goodbye, Marguerite. Well, uh, thank you for listening to us. And I really enjoyed, uh, uh, enjoyed this uh, webinar. Lovely. Thank you, Neha. Thank, thank you so much. I feel, I feel really inspired right now after reading everything and just hearing from everyone. It's been great. Thank you. Hola, Dumake. Thank you very much. I always leave every midwifery free webinar and meeting always inspired and energized despite all the things I face. But I'm glad to like speak to this large audience and I'm just happy that I, I never feel alone. I'm just very happy. <laughs> Lovely. Fiona? Thank you so much to everybody for all of your lovely comments and thank you um, for helping my midwifery family to grow all over the world. Amazing. Just a reminder to everybody watching that this webinar today is part of the Stronger Together webinar series that is being um, organized and run by the International Confederation of Midwives. There are a few more events coming up. We have Midwives in Leadership, which is on the 27th of October. And we also have um, Women and Midwives, which um, the date is to be confirmed for that event. All of your comments have been recorded for this session today. And as long as you've registered, which you have because you're here, you will be advised as to where you can watch the replay. So please let anyone that wasn't able to attend, let them know that if they register, they'll be able to access the recording. 
my name is Alicia Burnett. I'm a student midwife, a proud student midwife in London, England, and it's been absolutely fabulous to host this event for you today. Thank you so much for your attendance.